Chapter 17, Fake Summons. Though terrified, Nancy and Ned reacted quickly. With a tremendous leap, they managed to get out of the way of the oncoming car. The couple landed on some tree roots and lost their balance. Suddenly, it was dark around them. They realized that the driver of the car, which had almost hit them, had turned off his headlights. In a second, the car roared back into the street and sped away. Nancy and Ned picked themselves up and stared after the vehicle. By a streetlight, they caught a glimpse of the car. It was red in color. The driver deliberately tried to run us down, Ned stormed. That was your enemy, Nancy. I'm afraid so, she agreed. Ned, we must report this to the police at once. Let's go back to my car and drive downtown. Are you sure you're all right? Ned asked solicitously. You don't want to go back to the fraternity house first? Nancy assured him her nerves were steady now. I'm just mad, she said. The person in that car was either Edgar Nixon or one of his henchmen. I'm going to keep after him until he's brought to justice. Ned laughed. That a girl, he said, patting her shoulder. At police headquarters, they talked to Captain Crate. Ned told of the recent near accident. Then Nancy went on to reveal her suspicions about a man named Edgar Nixon, who ran a Lonely Hearts Club. Lonely Hearts Club, eh? The captain repeated. He turned the pages of a large book on his desk. I have a notation here to be on the lookout for such a person. We've had complaints from two women who said that an Edgar Nixon promised them a husband, but he never produced any. How did the club operate? Nancy asked. Captain Crate said that the total sum for finding a husband was $100, which was paid on the installment plan of $25 a month. These poor women sent their last payment but never heard from Nixon again. When they made inquiries at the houses where he had lived, they learned that he had moved away and left no forwarding address. Nancy reported how she had come upon one such address and seen a couple of letters, each one containing $25. But by that time he had moved. That's always the pattern, Captain Crate remarked. Do you know the names of any of his victims? Possibly one, she replied. Her name is the same as mine. That's how I became mixed up in the mystery. Nancy told him about the actress by the name of Nancy Smith Drew. I'm so afraid she's not only a victim of Edgar Nixon's dishonesty, but that he intends to marry her and help himself to an inheritance she's going to get. The police captain frowned. This is a complicated case. Well, I shall put out an alarm also for this Miss Nancy Smith Drew. Nancy then left with Ned and went back to the fraternity house. Bess and George were already in the girl's bedroom and were amazed at the story she had to tell about the near accident. It seems as if you aren't safe anywhere, Bess said. Nancy, please be careful. I promise, Nancy said with a chuckle. But my enemy seems to strike in such peculiar ways. All I can do is jump out of his path as fast as possible. She hurried to take a shower and get dressed for the dance. Dinner was merry, and afterward the couple strolled off to the gymnasium where the dance was to be held. Football star Ned Nickerson became the center of attention with congratulations, handshaking, and backslapping the order of the evening. Finally, as the band began to play, he escaped onto the dance floor with Nancy. The evening was about half over, and Nancy and Ned were seated on one side of the gym when a boy came up and said that Ned was wanted on the telephone. He excused himself to Nancy and hurried off. A moment later, the band started a lively tune, and one by one couples began to go back onto the dance floor. Bess, George, Bert, and Dave waved to Nancy as they passed by. At that moment, the music suddenly stopped and the drums began to roll. Everyone became quiet and listened attentively. The band leader called out, Where is Nancy Drew? Here I am, 
Nancy said, jumping up and raising her hand. Will you please step up here, the leader requested. The police want to see you. As Nancy hurried forward, a gasp went up around the room. Why did the police want to see her? When she reached the band, the young leader said, I'm sorry I had to call you out that way, but I didn't know you. Hope you don't mind. Not at all, said Nancy. Tell me, what's this about the police? She was told that two detectives were waiting for her on the stage of the adjoining theater. The student who came to give us the message said that they have news for you of the other Miss Drew. Excitedly, Nancy hurried from the gymnasium and down the long corridor, which led to the stage in the theater. The entrance door was open and footlights were on. The curtain had been hoisted about halfway up. Nancy looked around but did not see anyone. Where were the detectives? Hello, she called out, thinking they might have walked out into the far wings where the dressing rooms were. There was no answer. Nancy was puzzled and turned to look out over the darkened seats. As she stood pondering directly under the curtain, she heard a noise above her. A sixth sense told the young detective to move in a hurry. She jumped forward just as the heavy curtain crashed to the floor. Terror seized Nancy. She leaped across the footlights to the floor and sped as if on wings to the corridor leading to the gym. She had not gone far when she was met by Ned. Bess, George, Bert, and Dave were following. What's up? Ned asked, seeing the look of fright on Nancy's face. Turning, Nancy pointed back toward the stage. In there, the message was a hoax. Someone tried to kill me by dropping the curtain. Bess shrieked and held on to Nancy. Don't go back in there. She's right, said Bert. You girls stay here. We'll find out what's going on in the theater. Nancy, still shaken by what had happened, agreed to wait in the corridor with the other girls. The three boys were gone for several minutes, then returned to report they had found no one. Everyone was upset over the incident. Let's find the person who brought the message to the band leader, George suggested. Ned turned to the other boys. Isn't Jim Hankin on duty outside the gym tonight, he asked. Yes, I think he is. Ned explained that Jim was the guard for the evening to turn away from the dance anyone who was not invited. The group went at once to speak to him. Jim said a plain clothesman had come up to him and showed a badge. The detective said he did not want to intrude and asked that a student take the message to Nancy Drew. I didn't know her, so I asked our band leader to do it, Jim explained. He was quickly told what had happened and looked worried. I don't think that man will show up around here again, but if he does, I'll sure hold on to him and yell for help. Nancy spoke up. What did the man look like? She rather expected Jim to describe Edgar Nixon, but was told that the fake plain clothesman was tall, heavy set, and had blonde hair. Nancy assumed he was a pal of Edgar Nixon. The Lonely Hearts Club suspect probably did not want to take a chance on being identified and had sent someone else. He was probably an out-of-towner, not known to the Emerson police. Nancy and her friends returned to the dance, but they did not wait until it was over. Though Nancy hated to admit it, she was exhausted. The day had been a strenuous one for Ned, and he also was pretty tired. Everyone slept soundly, but was up in time the next morning to go to the special chapel service arranged for students and their dates. As soon as it was over, Nancy and Ned returned to the Omega Chi Epsilon house. The telephone was ringing, and the call proved to be for Nancy. It's from a Mrs. Gruen, she was told by the student on duty at the time. Nancy picked up the receiver and said, Hello, is everything all right? I'm fine, and your father is too, the housekeeper said. But things are not well with Ira Nixon. His brother came last night and robbed him. End of chapter 17